The desert holds an ancient secret. A secret guarded for centuries. But secrets can't be kept forever. forever. A mountain in a forbidden land, shrouded in mystery. Many have searched for it. Few have seen it. When I saw a question mark in the Bible, what is that doing there? I don't know why it's been ignored. I guess that tradition is so strong. Yet in Saudi Arabia, we find something doesn't belong there. The world needs to know that this is not myth and legend, not allegory. This is real. I just saw it. Now, two men have the proof. Larry looks over and looks me right in the eye and said, Bob, I think we're making history. Epic myth becomes burning truth. Mountain of fire. The precise location of Mount Sinai has eluded both archaeologists and theologians for centuries. It is the mountain of legend, chronicled in the Old Testament book of Exodus. The mountain where Moses saw the glory of the God of the Hebrews, where he fell to his knees in fear before a burning bush, and where he received the stone tablets containing holy law etched by the finger of God. Tradition has placed this fabled mountain squarely in the middle of the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. But an unlikely pair of adventurers believe differently. Well, in Orange County, California, I was a policeman for years. Started off being in patrol and then went into being a crime scene investigator, collecting evidence and analyzing crime scenes. And I was on the first SWAT team that they implemented on the police department. And it was pretty intense. I've spent the last uh, 40 years basically as a speculator trading stocks and commodities. I have a degree in the journalism from the University of Oregon, was raised in a religious family, so the, the history of religion has always interested me. Larry Williams is, is certainly one of the most interesting people I've ever met. A famous man, ran for United States Senator twice, Ronald Reagan campaigned for him, world-renowned commodities trader, a man of wealth. You could just instantly see in Bob that here was a guy that I had a lot of natural affinity with. I just felt good being around him, he was exciting. I walk away from business and do interesting things as well in my life, because life should be more than just business. I've always been enamored with treasure hunting, the great unknown, great stories about things like, oh yeah, that's a really cool story, but is there anything to it or is it myth? Well, I met a man named Jim Irwin who was the eighth man to walk on the moon. He was a piece of history. When he came back from the moon, he wanted to do something different with his life. He felt that he had a calling, a calling by God, to go look for lost locations in the Bible. He was involved heavily with looking for Noah's Ark at the time, and I thought that was fascinating. When you look at the great archaeological discoveries of the world, they have not been found by archaeologists. Whether it's the Machu Picchu or the lost city of Ur, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you go on and on, they're found by people that are adventurers. Well, that little question mark in the back of Bible is really what got me involved in this entire thing. My friendship with Bob and everything else notwithstanding, when I saw a question mark in the Bible, that piqued my interest. That, what is that doing there? Why don't people know? I thought everybody knew where it was. That question mark got me to spend a small fortune in this search. That search begins with a series of clues that came in the form of a mysterious letter written by explorer David Fossold and given to them by Irwin, hinting that the real Mount Sinai might actually be in Saudi Arabia. We had kind of a, a, an idea of where to go and how to get there, but David wasn't able to come back with any documentation because he was arrested and couldn't get anything out other than what he carried in his mind. Cornuke and Williams agree. They will use the book of Exodus as their roadmap. Through research, they begin to compile a list of sites they will have to find to identify the true Mount Sinai. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, the Israelites fled toward this holy mountain as they were pursued by the armies of Pharaoh. <laughs> They decide to start their quest by examining the site of the traditional Mount Sinai in Egypt, known simply as St. Catharines. 
It received its name, some say, by Queen Helena, mother of Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, and that she guessed that this was the mountain. And I guess being the mother of the Emperor of Rome, you have a little bit of power, and they put it down on a map, and then tradition just carries on. The Roman Church perpetuated it, we know, quite extensively in the fourth century as being Mount Sinai. And I climbed this mountain several years ago with Jim Irwin, the astronaut. We stood on top of the traditional Mount Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula. We looked around. Very disappointing. Beautiful mountain, beautiful scenery, awe-inspiring. But none of the geographical, geological formations fit with what the Bible was telling us. It, it, this wasn't out of Egypt. And St. Catharines is clearly in the Egyptian peninsula. It just didn't work. It wasn't on the backside of any desert. It wasn't in the area that the Bible said. We had the stunning realization, as many who have climbed that mountain have said this just simply is not the place. The book of Exodus tells the story of how God led Moses and the children of Israel through the desert to a point where they were confronted by the Red Sea. If you find the correct crossing site, it's easy to find the mountain. And if you find the mountain, it's easy to find the crossing site. It all comes together. It's like a trail of breadcrumbs that leads you to the correct location in an investigation. And the crossing site, a big part of the Exodus story, has just been avoided. People have thought it to be in the Upper Lakes region of the Suez, which is ridiculous. The Bible says that the Egyptians sunk like stones in the mighty sea. We have to have a sea, an ocean, to where they crossed the Red Sea. People seeing the movie have been blown away by what the Red Sea crossing was. I like a little physical reality in, in how this could have happened. As Bob and Larry examine the book of Exodus and take it at face value, another theory begins to emerge. If you read specifically as to what Flavius Josephus says, he describes his ridge of mountains going along, stopping into the sea, precluding them from going any other place. If you look at satellite imagery, it gives a wide, clear area along the western side of the Sinai Peninsula, almost like a highway to the tip and then turning upward, creating like a cul-de-sac area. They probably went through the Red Sea right at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula in a place called Sharm el Sheikh. It's remarkable. It's not like a coral reef surrounding the outside of the tip of a peninsula or something that you see in normal coral reef configurations. This goes right through the sea. And it's interesting to note here that God in scripture says, I will make for you a roadway through the sea. It actually has a coral barrier that comes out and Bob and I have pictures of ourselves at high tide, not low tide, with the tide up to about my waist standing on this barrier, this reef barrier there. They would have had a pedestal under the surface of the water, a wide ribbon of land that goes under the water that when the waters parted, they could walk upon that would allow them an escape route and go through the sea. The book of Exodus records that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. So we have the precision of scripture, the historical records, and the physical geography of the area all coming together and creating a picture that this is the most likely site of the crossing point. The Bible says that they crossed through the Red Sea, and it was the mighty waters of the Red Sea. That's simple, we need to look there. The Bible says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Galatians 4.25 says, now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. The Bible says it's in the ancient land of Midian, where Moses met God on Mount Sinai. Why aren't we following the clues given us in scripture? The Bible is like a road map. It's like a compass that you can open up and follow these clues. For about 600 year, years at least, we have records of people saying that Mount Sinai should be in Saudi Arabia. Now Josephus around 90 AD makes this claim. Well, this designation that Josephus is talking about is not in the Sinai Peninsula, but in Arabia, which would be, according to our calculations, on a mountain called Jabal al-Laws.
Bible says, when God is speaking to Moses, you shall return to Egypt and come back and serve God on this mountain, meaning that he needs to come back to Midian, which is not in Egypt. Tradition is a powerful thing. And once you start fooling with tradition, even if it's legitimate evidence, it is very, very difficult for people to let go of that. Without the official invitation from a Saudi citizen, obtaining entry visas proves to be impossible. Well, it is difficult to get into Saudi Arabia. You just don't go there. We had to manufacture a way to get into the country. I was warned by Jim Irwin that this would be very dangerous. And he gave me the illustration of when he was going to the moon, they shut the door. He said it was like a dungeon door closing. He said at that moment, it was no turning back. You are going. And the chances of death are there. And I knew that going. Another friend that I met, a, a Greek fellow, said, well, I think I know how to get you in, Larry. Uh, I have a letter from the king of Saudi Arabia, and we'll take his signature, and we'll put it on his uh, letterhead, which I have, and we'll change the fax machine on my fax to read his fax number, and we'll put the time at the time in Riyadh, and we're going to fax this letter to the embassy here in London. And it basically, the letter's going to say, this is from the king, and I want these guys in and in a hurry. Get them in. So we fax it to the Saudi embassy about, I don't know, maybe eight blocks away. And uh, sure enough, we got in. in a real quick time period. The king carries a lot of weight there. Bob was more than uncomfortable with it. Uh, it bothered him a great deal. I think to this day it probably still does. Bob and I come from two different views on this. Um, he has a lot stronger religious beliefs and feelings than I do about things. And I'm kind of like oh, the doubting Thomas of all this stuff. And to me, it was just a question of how do you get in? When they closed that door on that Saudi airliner, we were going, and there was no turning back. Getting into Saudi Arabia is one thing. Finding the mountain is another. Using the letter given to them by Jim Irwin, Cornuke and Williams drive out into the vast Saudi desert, hoping luck will follow. Well, the desert over there is just an ex a huge expanse and just an almost an endless sea of sand and rock. And the heat is so hot that it just sucks the air right out of your lungs. It, it's frightening to even breathe that 128 degree heat. The only problem was with David's description was take a right at a big rock and then go 0.6 kilometers and take a left at another big rock. The desert's really easy to get lost in. With a limited water supply and maps that are now essentially useless, Bob and Larry become hopelessly lost when suddenly a band of Bedouin desert dwellers come to their aid. Here we're sitting there and we're saying, do you know where Jabal El Oz is? And he walked out just to the edge of this hill, so the hill's hiding us, and pointed. Jabal El Oz, Jabal Musa. Bob and Larry get their first look at the mysterious peak. Could this be the holy mountain of God spoken of in the Old Testament? Jabal Musa, which I knew clearly was Arabic for the mountain of Moses. He clearly knew this there as Moses' mountain. It's such an interesting mountain. When you see Jabal al Laws from a distance, you think, that my first impression was, uh, there must be a cloud up there, there's a shadow over it. Because the corner of the top, kind of a triangular part, is black. We know the Bible says that God descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. So for me, it was a, kind of a surreal moment. As they move closer to the mountain, they are confronted with a harsh reality. Warning signs posted in both Arabic and English, and impenetrable high barbed wire fences surrounding the base of the mountain. Aware now of the fact that they could be spotted at any moment, the two move ahead cautiously, looking for any evidence they can find. What they find next will leave them breathless. I'm looking for markings and paintings and little etchings around the mountain, and I kind of walked upon it. Come on over here, come on over here. I'm looking for a little something a little like this. And I looked up and I saw this huge rock monolith. This is actual video footage of their remarkable find, smuggled out of Saudi Arabia at great risk. Well, the altar is obviously man-made. It's immense. It would have taken hundreds of men or thousands of men to erect. 
And so this wasn't a band of nomads that erected this. And this altar site is out in the middle of a huge, flat, arid field. There's no rocks close to it at all. I mean, it, it stands all by itself, right, Bob? There's, there's nothing close to it. So the rocks didn't just grow there. They came from some place. Bob and Larry move in closer to examine mysterious petroglyphs on the side of the altar, instantly recognizing their similarity to the ancient Egyptian deities, Apis and Hathor. I figured that if, if this was Mount Sinai, this had to be the altar where they made the golden calf. Why would you put a fence around a random rock pile? They wouldn't. They know that this has great importance. And they've erected a fence with barbed wire to keep people away. Under the constant threat of being spotted by patrolling guards, the two agree they have precious little time to explore further around the base of the mountain. Uh, we were able to notice what I call boundary markers. If you study this closely, you'll see these big piles of rock, or oh, maybe four and a half feet tall, three and a half feet tall, maybe six feet in diameter, and they're clearly around the mountain. The mountain was considered to be so holy that if the people just touched it, they would die. So Moses was told to put boundary markers around the mountain to keep the people away. And sure enough, around this mountain, about every 400 yards, there are these rock piles. And why would you put these huge rock piles in precise, linear fashion around the mountain? After a few hours of restless sleep, Bob and Larry decide it is time to climb Jebel al -Az. And we crested the top of the knoll and we're welcomed by an incredible sunrise. The sunrise is just awe-inspiring. But when we get up there, the rocks are clearly black, just like a chalkboard black on the outside, and you break the rocks open, and they're not black on the inside. And then as you come down the mountain, there's no more blackened rocks. Some maps will show that they're vulcanized rock. It came from a volcanic eruption. But when we lifted these rocks up, and Larry and I were smashing them on top of the mountain, and they'd break open and you'd have this almost pinkish brown granite that would be exposed when you broke the rocks open. We realized then, that of course, they're not volcanic. But what are they? And based on all the other evidence, it started to mount, uh, like a police investigator, the degrees of probability increased and our excitement started to increase also. What went through my mind was watching the experience Bob was having. He pulled out his Bible and started to write something in his Bible. And I know Bob went through a lot of top of Chapel of Allah. We thought that we might be standing on holy ground. I mean, just think about the significance of Sinai. It was a moment for me. The Bible became vibrantly real at that moment. To think that I could be standing where Moses was told to take off his sandals. And I looked down and I said, hmm, there could be something to this story. You know, the blackened rocks up there and all the other things. That, there might be some of this activist stuff here in Saudi Arabia. Now the thing I'm thinking about is, is if this is the real Mount Sinai, the world needs to know that this is not myth and legend, not allegory. This is real. And I said to Larry, I said, you know, what are we doing here? And I'll never forget it. Larry looks over and looks me right in the eye and said, Bob, I think we're making history. With darkness approaching, the two use night vision goggles to find their way. As they descend, they come upon an amazing sight. The Bible talks about this altar that Moses made at the foot of the mountain and established 12 stone pillars, and they did burnt offerings at this site. And it's at the foot of the mountain. Angular shaped. Angular shaped. It had two channels on it. It may not be the ultimate answer, but if you got four aces, you better bet you're going to win the hand. And I like this is, we got four aces with a king kicking it. This is, this is a lot of stuff that's going here. Though excited about their discoveries, Cornuke and Williams know they need to find at least one other distinguishing feature on the mountain if this is the true Mount Sinai. Well, Mount Sinai and Horeb are synonymous. They mean the same thing in scripture. And to be the real Mount Sinai, 
you need to have a cave on that mountain. The Bible specifically talks about a cave on the mountain that Elijah visited with a cloak over his face and he looked out at the valley below, the Bible says. Looking across from their position, they spot what appears to be the opening of a large cave. Though unable to reach it, Cornuke and Williams clearly know its significance. When you go to St. Catharines, there's no cave there. They said, where did Elijah go? They wanted to manufacture and put a cave that fits with what the Bible says you couldn't put it in a better location. Now in broad daylight, and with the increasing probability that they will be discovered, the pair decide to make their way down the mountain quickly. And Bob slipped a little bit at one point. I slipped bad. And there was a deep crevasse that went down 50 feet. And this shale came loose and I slid and I just started clawing desperately, trying to grab some brush or something, and was going off the edge. And Larry swung his hand and grabbed my vest. And we realized uh, we're, we're pushing it too hard. We're out of water, we're gonna kill ourselves. When you go do an investigation as a police officer, as I've done many investigations, if you're looking at the wrong suspect, nothing's going to fit. It's going to be a frustrating, fruitless investigation. But if you find the right guy, everything starts falling into place. If I was a district attorney, I'd certainly prosecute this mountain as being Mount Sinai. The jury hasn't come in yet, okay? But I think we'd win the jury. Arrested by a desert frontier patrol shortly after leaving the mountain, Cornuk and Williams sadly must throw much of their most valuable evidence into the desert as they are led to the authorities and to book. So winning the jury on just their own findings with what little evidence they are able to keep might have proven impossible and caused this adventure to slip into the dust pile of undocumented myth and legend. But amazingly, the findings of another unique pair of explorers provide even more compelling evidence and credibility to the historic discoveries made by Cornuke and Williams four years earlier. At great peril, great risk, they went out to this mountain on several occasions, did extensive research, lived amongst the rocks, took their children with them. This is a phenomenal family that knew the implications of what was at this mountain and took it upon themselves to go and try and find the best evidence. Working for an American oil company based in Saudi Arabia, the Caldwells are subject to company policy imposed by the Saudi government that all foreigners leave the country for at least 24 days of the year. In the aftermath of the Gulf War, Jim and Penny's travel options are limited, so a trip to the west, toward Egypt, becomes a clear option. St. Catharines is first on their list of sites to visit. Yeah, it took everything out of me when we got there to see that it, it just didn't match the biblical description. I was so disappointed. Deciding to leave St. Catharines, the Caldwells continue their journey through Egypt, where a brief stop in a roadside bookstore reveals a surprise in the form of a book called The Gold Mines of Midian. We began to look at it. It was written by Sir Richard Burton in the 1800s. He was an explorer of vast amounts of the former Ottoman Empire, including Arabia. And he had drawn a map in the back, and as we pulled that map out, that map had a beautiful rendition of the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, Sinai Peninsula, but it also had just a little portion of this uh, northwestern quadrant of Arabia, and it listed that land as M-A-D-Y-A-N. He's saying Midian's over there, and if you can find Midian, you can find the region where Mount Sinai was, because that's where Moses was supposedly tending the flocks of Jethro. Well, we found another book in the bookstore called The Mountain of God. This was by Emmanuel Anadi. He also mentions Jebel al Laws as being a potential site. The Caldwells pack up and head for Saudi Arabia and begin to search for the highest mountain in Midian. Though free to travel through Saudi Arabia on work visas, no permission has been granted to enter the government-imposed forbidden zone around Jebel al Laws. The mountain peaks seemed extraordinarily high to me, and even the very top of Jebel al Laws was even enshrouded in cloud from time to time. That's how high it appeared, and that was my first reaction that, gosh, this is so much different than the uh, picture that came to my mind in St. Catharines, the traditional site of Mount Sinai. We're at the 4,000-foot level. These mountains are way up there, another 4,000, 5,000 feet above us. 
the altar with petroglyphs is their first discovery. We came around the front side of that and didn't really see anything, but as you go around to the back side, the cows started becoming very visible. My daughter was there and she says, Dad, there's 12 cows. Okay, good. And she was only like eight years old at the time. They came out of Egypt. They would have been knowledgeable of the worship of this pagan idol called Apis or Hathor. When they said that Moses is not coming down from the mountain after he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights, they reverted back to their pagan ways. Moses asks Aaron, I've come down the mountain. What on earth has happened here? And Aaron says, I took the ornaments from them. I took their gold and I put it into the fire and out popped this calf. But he makes it very plain that there was a single calf. I built the altar, I put it on the altar, and I turned to the people and I said, These be thy gods, plural, O Israel, which have led thee up out of the land of Egypt. It's something struck me very strange about that because if you put one golden calf atop an altar, why would you say, These be thy gods, O Israel, if you've got one golden calf? Did he make more than one golden calf? You know, it, it puzzled me for a good length of time. Like Bob and Larry, the Caldwells look for the scriptural indicators. In studying some of the Hebrew, it says that Aaron fashioned the calf with a graving tool. It literally says, to engrave, as in something we would engrave a name on today. That sounds very strange because you, you, you mold something that's molten. You don't engrave it. But the way you built an altar in Egypt was to, in relief, cover it with gods, and then put a chief deity, a statue of the chief deity, on it. If a golden calf were to have been put on the top, that scripture would not contradict itself. It would absolutely perfectly fit. And he would have placed it atop and said, in fact, these be thy gods, O Israel, which have led thee up out of the land of Egypt. When you go there, you can read the Bible like a map. And it says, this is here. Then you go for 10 steps, and this is here. For lots of people our age, you have to smack them in the face for them to believe something. Most of the, today's generation doesn't want to accept things that they can't see and touch and feel. You know, when you show them something like the Bible and what it says, you know, this isn't just a story that somebody's trying to teach you in Sunday school. This is something real, and here's the proof. Oh, too. It looks like a person. It's hard not to believe. You could take thousands of theologians and put them in a room and have them read the Bible and not one of them are going to come away saying the same thing about what it says. But yet you could take a four or five year old child and tell them the story and they'll understand it. The significance is finding anything Egyptian in Saudi Arabia and on top of that no archaeologist ever has found a scintilla or a trace of anything at St. Catherine's. Nothing's been found there. Yet in Saudi Arabia, we find something doesn't belong there. Egyptian artifacts in Saudi Arabia. The top of Sinai is very black, darkened rock. It has a uh, appearance of, in some light, coal. It's extremely interesting because the closer you get up toward the blackened peak, you can see where the red, red granite folds down and the black begins. And it's a dividing line that is like night and day. In some light, it actually has a blue tinge to it. And one of the verses in scripture talks about the top of the mountain as if it were a sapphire stone. Especially toward noonday, it gets a shiny patina on it to where it looks like you're walking around on obsidian. It is literally that shiny and that black. Basically, there are three different kinds of rocks. These are igneous rocks, those that are formed from volcanic activity, 
Then there are sedimentary rocks which are formed under the oceans, under the lakes, and in riverbeds, and so on. And then there's a third variety called metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks are those that are recrystallized under temperature and pressure conditions. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, uh, when I looked at the thin section, it told me that it is a metamorphic rock. When you stand there and you look all the way around you, there are convoluted mountain ranges going off in every direction, and there are none that are the color of the one you're standing on. It is black, and every bit of the rest of it is a red, burnished, brownish granite, as far as the eye can see. From high atop the mountain, Jim and Penny see the V-shaped altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is what inspired us to continue to go back to the mountain. This is where the pillars are. And what are they doing there? These huge stone pillars. Again, civilization would have been required to construct these. It says in chapter 24 of Exodus that Moses got up early, he erected 12 pillars, he built an altar there at the base of the mountain, and then he brings oxen in for sacrifice. Recent excavations show evidence of ancient ash deep in the soil at this site. The 12 pillars were signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. What would we have for pillars? We found these white stone pillars, about 22, 24 inches in diameter. They're kind of a white, soft, marble-ish type material. They would have stacked right on top of one another. Uh, ancient Egyptian photographs show that this is a style of building a, a pillar type formation. Now, we don't know it's an altar. If it's a rock formation, whatever it is, but I mean, what is it doing there? And, and why 12 pillars? And, and why not nine? Why not 14? Why 12? The Bible says it was of uncut stone and no steps. I mean, the precision of, of Scripture in here is amazing because it calls out that this altar is located right at the foot of the mountain. And sure enough, there it sat. From that moment forward, it was my mission, Penny and I together and the kids, we were going to document everything we could about it because our greatest fear was that once the Saudis realized exactly what they may have, they would come in with bulldozers and eliminate it. Jim Caldwell is able to explore the cave that Bob and Larry could only see from a distance. It is dead front of the mountain. It was a lot higher than I thought it was. The entrance looks small. It's 15 feet high. It's a big cave. I was able to climb into it. It's about 20 feet deep. There is a place for somebody to bed down in the back of it. One of the things I did is when I was walking to the back of it, I swung around with my video camera, and the view was awe-inspiring. You could see the Golden Calf Altar, the plain where the thousands of tents would have been located out there. The Caldwells will visit the mountain a total of 14 times over a period of eight years, camping in different locations each time to increase their chances of finding more archaeological sites. Their confidence that Jabal al Az is the real Mount Sinai begins to deepen as they find several more distinctive, though puzzling items around the mountain. Amazing because of its rarity, a lone cedar tree comes into view. The trunk of this enormous tree is eight feet wide and clearly shows its age. Even smaller olive trees in Israel have been dated at more than 2,000 years old. Exodus chapter 3 records that God spoke to Moses in the form of a burning bush. Jim and Penny can't help but wonder, could this be the very plant? The Caldwells also find numerous almond trees around the mountain, significant because of how they lend credibility to the account of Aaron's rod made of almond wood, which budded and produced ripe almonds, according to Numbers 17.8. Additionally, quail can be seen all over the area. It is theorized that they fly in huge numbers over the Red Sea from Egypt, only to fall to the ground exhausted on the Arabian side. Exodus 16.13 records that in the evening, quail covered the camp of the Israelites. Jim and Penny also find grinding stones, spear points, and other sorts of weapons, all fashioned in the Egyptian style. 
which the Israelites would have learned during their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But the most compelling of their discoveries is also the most mysterious. I think the greatest find around this mountain was the split rock discovery. We had nothing to do with the split rock discovery. It was brought to our attention by the Caldwell family. This to me is the real nail in this whole thing that drives it home that this is the real Mount Sinai. And we came up to a break in the rocks and I looked over from the north looking due south and both of us were just stunned. There two miles away was a monolith that just stood out in the landscape. In that valley, there are numerous natural outcroppings of hills that are just comprised of boulders. And then there is this one with this massive rock sitting atop of it. From a distance, it's big. When you're close to it, it is enormous. It's four stories tall. And I've often said that the miracle that would have happened there probably rivaled or surpassed the crossing of the Red Sea. The Exodus account says that the people of Israel grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Your tongue feels like a piece of tar from a Texas highway when you're out in the desert. The sun is relentless. They would have cried out for water. And, of course, Moses heard their cries, petitioned God. Moses struck the rock, and it split right down the middle from top to bottom. The Bible literally says the water gushed from this. I climbed up the backside to the very base of this rock, and right at the base of that split, it's deeply gouged, and the rock on either side, if you look straight up from the inside of that rock, it's really, really smooth, but it's pressure flaked. Big chunks of granite have been flaked from the bottom, and it, it, it's not a normal erosive pattern for granite. Granite generally, from just wind and erosion, will crack and flake off from the top down. This is coming up as though something came flying up and really gouged the rock. When that rock was split into, a geyser erupted out of the top of it. It blew those two pieces of that rock apart. It's very interesting. This part of the world gets a half an inch of rain every 10 years. And it's so arid and so dry. Yet this rock shows distinct evidence of water erosion, not just a trickle, a burst of water flowing from it, washing out the whole mountainside, going down and washing all the sand that's down below it, creating a, an ancient lake bed down below. Now you're talking about anywhere from 600,000 estimates of up to 2 million people that came out of Egypt. If we were talking about a tiny little rock with a tiny little trickle, they would still be in line waiting to get a sip of that water. This place would have filled with water so quickly that that entire group of people could have come around the edges of this two or three mile long area and immediately taken their fill of water. It's very compelling. If you were to show the picture to somebody and say, well, it came from Colorado or Utah, well, you accept that. But if you say this came from one of the most arid places in the world where there are no rivers. The most graphic description would be found in Psalms. Thou didst cleave the rock in the wilderness and the waters ran down as rivers. And that Hebrew word for clave means to split cleanly in two. There is no such candidate or any other site that has been investigated or is currently being investigated as Mount Sinai. Following their theory of the crossing site, Cornuk and Williams begin to retrace the possible trail of the Exodus route from the Saudi Arabian shore back toward the mountain. Well, if they would have crossed through the Red Sea, at the point that we surmised. The Bible gives us clear indications of what they encountered. They would have gone three days journey into the wilderness and encountered the bitter springs of Mara. We went 33 kilometers inland driving. 33 kilometers is about a three day hike and journey through the desert. We came to these bitter springs. We went down and touched it to our tongue and it was so repulsive. For four hours later, you could still taste it. It was, it was horrible. The Bible talks about it, the bitter springs of Mara. Mara means bitter in Hebrew. And the Bible says that they went on and they eventually came to the 70 palms and 12 springs of Elam. We roll up to this group of palm trees and 12 springs of water bubbling up out of the ground. Traveling further north in the direction of the mountain, the pair come upon an awesome sight. My gosh, you look over there and there's caves that look like Egyptian caves to me, blocked off with this high barbed wire fence 
and it, to me it's the caves of, of Moses or probably where Jethro came from. It's very interesting to note that this city is known in history as the city of Madian, presently known as Albat. But if you look at history, Flavius Josephus and other historians talk about the highest mountain near the city of Madian as being the real Mount Sinai. Well, this would place Jabal el Laws as the number one candidate, according to the ancient historians from 2,000 years ago, from 250 BC, as being the real Mount Sinai. The bitter springs of Mara, the 70 palms of Elam, the 12 springs of Elam, they were like breadcrumbs leading you to a location. It was that simple. I guess one of the most intriguing things is in an area that is close to the split rock, there are footprints that have been carved all over the rocks. When you pair that up with the scripture in Deuteronomy where Moses says to the children of Israel, you're now about to go in and possess the land and wherever you place the soles of your feet, God will give you the land. Now that's a very interesting thing because if you are a wandering people, how would you mark out places that you had been? If the title deed to your land is wherever you place the soles of your feet, isn't it interesting that there are so many little feet? It's very compelling. It's a full 10 years after Bob and Larry's adventure that both teams get together to share their stories. After Larry and I had been to the mountain, we discovered that there was another couple of people, or a whole family that had been to Jabal Laws and had filmed it. And I got so excited, I called them and it was 2.30 in the morning in Saudi Arabia. And I'm sorry for doing that to you all, but I, I called them at 2.30 in the morning and, and I said, hey. Uh, there was this excited wild man on the other end of the phone. Then I heard about these people that found all this stuff more than what we saw. I saw, but I actually have nothing but admiration for what they did to take what we did to the next level to further document it and, and to be so willing to share it with the world, really. Knowing that they were going back to the country and had access to some of these areas was just what an opportunity. To go to the traditional Mount Sinai, what you find there is a circus event a monastery built on top of what would have been a holy site, Egyptians selling their wares. It's comical, actually, uh, a mountain that doesn't fit the biblical description. As a police investigator, you know, evidence isn't proof. It doesn't prove anything. It's the interpretation of proof, and it has to be the proper interpretation of proof. Frankly, until credentialed archaeologists have come in, documented it, dug it, recorded it, written about it, do we know for sure? I don't think so. Is it the best place right now? Without a doubt. That's where you have to believe a little bit, but because you can prove that something is true in there, lends credibility to the document. And I think that in this situation, we have a monument to many miracles that occurred. Probably in the Old Testament, more miracles were performed at Mount Sinai than any other place. And what so impresses me about this site is the way it is preserved. It's perfectly preserved in time. We have more facts going. We have more religious history and academic history going at this site than virtually any other site. And some scholars will say, since they haven't found any evidence that the traditional mountain of the Sinai Peninsula, that the exodus never occurred. Logical but, conclusion. Logical yeah. conclusion. But look at the evidence in Saudi Arabia. It's all over the place. It looks like the movie set where they made the movie The Ten Commandments and just abandoned it. I saw a question mark in the Bible. What is that doing there? We stood on top of the traditional Mount Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula. We looked around. It just didn't match the biblical description. If you find the correct crossing site, it's easy to find the mountain. Well, I like a little physical reality. This goes right through the sea. When you look at the great archaeological discoveries of the world, and they're found by people that are adventurers. When you go there, you can read the Bible like a map. They were like breadcrumbs leading you to a location. Mount Sinai should be in Saudi Arabia. On a mountain called Jabal Awaz. Mountain ranges going off in every direction. Jabal Musa, the mountain of Moses. There are none that are the color of the one you're standing on. And the Saudis have put a fence around it, and of course they know exactly what they have. Something real, and here's the proof. I'm kind of like oh, the doubting Thomas of all this stuff. The world needs to know that this is not myth and legend. It's very compelling. Not allegory. It's perfectly preserved in time. This is real. Is it the best place right now? Without a doubt. We thought that we might be standing 
on holy ground. Why can't we ever put our hands on any kind of artifact that's going to show that the oldest of the stories of the Bible were true? If I was a district attorney, I'd certainly prosecute this mountain as being Mount Sinai. Larry looks over and looks me right in the eye and said, Bob, I think we're making history. The evidence is overwhelming that Jabal lost.